It's one of Australia's greatest mysteries. She was known as this firebrand of a woman. A famous designer murdered in her prime. One of those things will never leave your mind. A robbery gone wrong or someone close to home. Who benefited most from the will? Me. Or was she the victim of a notorious serial killer? They were like magnets attracted to each other. Adam Shan rebuilds the case piece by piece. Did you tell the police this? Don't think they ever asked. And discovers new evidence that changes everything. Did you give a statement? No. No statements ever taken from me. This is Royalston Street, Paddington, a quiet little pocket a few kilometres from the heart of Sydney. See this row of townhouses over here? Back in the 70s, this was the factory of a wallpaper designer named Florence Broadhurst. One Saturday afternoon in October 1977, Broadhurst was murdered inside her factory. Her body was not discovered until the next day. And the story of how Florence was found has never been told. The first responder on the scene was Tony Russell, a 19-year-old police constable on his very first day on the job at Paddington Station. Tony's never spoken about what happened that day until now. I took a phone call on the police station. A gentleman on the phone expressed concern for a lady across the street. And he gave this address. He said, look, the front door's been open all night the lights are on, and he's concerned for her welfare. Could we come down and check on the lady? I said to the sergeant, we have a job, and we proceeded down to uh, Ralston Street in uh, Paddington. We were met by the gentleman who lived across the road. We said, we'll go in and take a look. What's happened is we've walked in the front door, and there's a lot of racks from all the wallpaper and the colours and the mixes. It's very dark downstairs. I was feeling very anxious, actually. You don't know what you're walking into. Expecting something, your adrenaline's pumping. Sergeant went upstairs. I searched downstairs. I went between all the racks. As I came around the back of the factory, I remember seeing this door at the back of the factory. It was slightly ajar. There was a plastic bin just inside that door was full of timber. Now I noticed one lump of timber had red on it, a red substance, so I picked the timber up and had a look at it. And I thought, I'll just remember that for a later date, and put it back in the bin. What do you think it was? I thought it was paint, but it turned out to be blood. I was told it was a murder weapon. I walked upstairs. I spoke to Sergeant, he, he checked the um, office and the kitchen annex. There was a handbag on the desk, which he pointed out. The carpet at the end of the hallway was wet. It was really soggy. So we couldn't work out why. Anyway, we're about to leave. There was nothing there to indicate to us there was anyone around. Like, there was no signs of a struggle. There was no blood on the walls in the annex or the office and uh, I, just thought, <laughs> I said I'd better go and use the loo before we go if it's checked in there and he said no so, so that's okay I'll, I'll check it as I went to open the door I remember it was a, uh, a bit stiff so I'll give it the old football barge first thing I've seen is the head of Florence Broadhurst on the toilet with her arm up around the top of her head. And her body was outstretched, but as I've opened the door, I've, I've covered up half her body. I turned white and quickly left the building. 
I informed the sergeant on the way up to get the fresh air that he'd better check. Did you tell him what you'd seen? Yeah, he came down a couple of minutes later and confirmed. Detectives from Paddington turned up and they handed the homicide. What stays with you about that? Well, what's the image that really stays with you? And, uh... The fact that Florence Broadhurst had bright red hair. Now, her hair was wet because what the murderer had done is put her head in the toilet. A scary image. Having the red hair just made it worse. One of those things will never leave your mind. And, um, yeah, it affects me greatly. She was known as this firebrand of a woman. One of her good friends described her as a burning flame. And she looked like that too. She had dyed red hair. She had oftentimes false eyelashes that matched the red hair. Makeup made to be looked at. And she was kind of dressed to kill. She used to wear funky, crazy, colorful clothes that women 30 years, 40 years her junior would be wearing. This country had never seen anything like Florence, and I doubt it ever will again. When it came to dynamic and diverse designs, Broadhurst was in a league of her own, both here and abroad. <laughs> Could we have a look at some of your designs, please, Miss Broadhurst? Yes, of course. This is the sort of design that we used to do for mm. people. When I first began 15 years ago, people were very nervous of wallpaper. And they said, make a little one. You're not too big now. Don't be too bold. No, we can't stand that. So this was a sort of one of the original design. Florence's death sent shockwaves through Sydney. People couldn't believe that a woman this vivid had been destroyed and so brutally. It's an understatement to say that Mrs. Broadhurst was well known in her field. The factory here is a big establishment, and as one of the people inside told me today, to meet her list of clients, you'd have to start at the very top of the social register, and then very gradually make your way down. Police today said they were carrying out routine investigations. Apparently, the assailant walked into the building through the open door. According to neighbours, Mrs. Broadhurst usually left the door open so clients could drop in. What it looks like, she's gone in there to try and escape from the person attacking her because there's no evidence outside of a struggle. The evidence that I've seen indicates that she was in the toilet when she was bludgeoned. Someone's grabbed her and put her head into the toilet flush the toilet and that's where the water came outside. Police would later discover that $8,000 in cash had been taken from Broadhurst's handbag. Seven expensive rings had been forcibly removed from her fingers. A question that's since been debated is whether or not Florence was sexually assaulted before she was killed in the door, you could only see her from the waist up. Yeah. So you couldn't ascertain yeah. what was happening below the waist. Mm. But then the coroner and homicide detectives arrive and they take the body out of there. Yeah. Is that when you conclude that she's fully dressed? Yeah. What was she wearing? Um, she was wearing um, a blouse and a pair of slacks and a pair of shoes. Florence was uh, completely dressed. No sexual assault, no nothing. <laughs> That's crucial information, as you'll come to discover in this investigation. This three-page document, an undated police report, is the only official record of the murder of Florence Broadhurst that seems to exist. The murder file, as far as I can tell, has been lost. What remains is just a short summary of the post-mortem examination and a suggestion the New South Wales government offer a reward for information as the investigation was struggling. Just like this document, the investigation was slight and resolved nothing. And Tony Russell was never questioned by the investigators, despite the fact that he found the body. Tonight, we look at why the police investigation went astray, and we'll try to find a pathway back to the truth. After finding the body, you went home. 
Do you remember going home with your feelings on your first day on the job? Uh, never got home. Um, ended up at the pub. I don't know how long that, that drinking session went for, but it was days. Um, just trying to erase the memory. But you can't erase it. You still think about these things a lot, don't you, Tony? It's been on my mind for a long time. Coming up... Florence was an absolute chameleon, right from the word go. The many lives of Florence Broadhurst. So she lied to you? Absolutely. She lied to everybody. Florence Broadhurst, an icon of Australian design, was murdered in her own factory. Who would do such a thing? To understand the complexity of this case, we have to understand Florence. And Florence was a complex woman. Florence was an absolute chameleon, right from the word go. She was born in a dusty part of Australia in, uh, in the middle of one of the old cattle stations. Her first home was an old worker's cottage, timber built with a corrugated iron roof. They really didn't have anything at all. Florence was lucky enough to be born with a beautiful contralto voice, and she managed to sing her way out of the bush and sing her way out of the country. So by the early 1920s, she had joined a vaudeville troupe. She was performing as somebody called Bobby Broadhurst. Now, this was the first of what was a series of incarnations for Florence. Florence made her way to Shanghai, where in 1927, she created the Broadhurst Academy, a finishing school for the children of wealthy expats. But it didn't last. She then moved to London, and she reinvented herself one more time. She visited Paris a lot, she clearly takes some notes. Within a few years, back in London in 1933, she had launched herself as a new person entirely called Madame Pellier. Now, Madame Pellier was not only French, she was a couturier. She had an outlet in New Bond Street, London. She took adverts out where she claimed she would dress everybody. And indeed, she did manage to dress the rich and famous. She dressed debutantes. She dressed uh, theatre folk. When war came to London, Broadhurst survived the Blitz. But a more radical change was coming. In 1949, she moved to Sydney. By which time she was pretending to be not just English, but an English aristocrat. She told people that she knew Winston Churchill, that she was friends with the royals, that she had a life in England that was quite wonderful and that she was in the colonies, darling, to get over the terrible ravages of the war. Where did you think she came from? London. 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 She was happy to let you think that? Yeah. Oh, she told <laughs> me that. Yeah. Right. So she lied to you? Absolutely. She lied to everybody. Lots of lies? Lots. <laughs> in the 1960s, Florence Broadhurst hired a young designer, Kate Darja to assist with a new wallpaper venture. How did she address you? Kathy, my clever little Kathy. Oh, darling, you're so clever. You know, she would, because um, we got paid virtually nothing, but, you know, she would have a way of endearing herself to you and making you feel important. 
Before long, Florence Broadhurst Design was winning accolades around the world. I think in Australia we're very lucky to have a person who I think is the finest producer of wallpaper in the whole world, and that's Florence Broadhurst. Miss Broadhurst, thank you for inviting us to the studio today. It's a pleasure. Yes. My pleasure. You have everything you can imagine that people might have wanted at that time, whether they knew they wanted it or not. And part of the Broadhurst story is a story of salesmanship. She was rather brilliant at figuring out what people wanted before they knew it themselves. The jungle is very good. This is a very good one. And you've designed all these, Miss Broadhurst, have you? You have to, oh yes. How many there new designs do you do? There's 800, oh, you can't. You've got tiger's red gold and all this foliage in a, on a yellow gold foil and black. It's dramatic, it looks terribly good on the wall. It's, mm. it's sold for bathrooms and uh, playrooms and mm. it's in my hall on the way up in different colors. She would take a motive or a feeling and then she would give it to me or whoever and say, look, I want this like this and maybe we can add a bird and, you know, a little bit of a scroll here. And... These peacocks, did you design them with anything special in mind? Well, this, yes, was designed for a job in Saudi Arabia. I went out to Saudi Arabia to do really? some... I thought first the, the thing there would be peacocks would be marvellous. They looked lovely too in, a, uh, in foils and things. She had another factory that produced the actual paper. Yes. Robert Lloyd Lewis is the only the child paper. of Florence Broadhurst. How much do you see of her in these designs? I see colour uh, and her creativity, uh, her ability to move forward continually. There are so many different scenarios about how she was killed and who did it. Yeah. Who do you think did it? At the time, I was quite convinced that it was somebody who was either an employee at the time or at least a past employee. I still believe that to be the case. According to Robert, his mother led some employees to believe they were co-owners in the business. Maybe my mother was able to get people encouraged to work by suggesting to them that uh, you're going to be a shareholder or you are a shareholder or you're going to this is our business um, and then to find out that maybe that they're not or you know how can you sack me i'm a shareholder the discontent over ownership wasn't only about shares in the business there have long been rumours that Broadhurst claimed the work of others as her own. Helen O'Neill puts those allegations to rest. Are you confident it was Florence? I am, yes. I'm very confident it was Florence. Because of the lengths she went to to direct those artists to do exactly what she wanted. She was the vision. She was the signature. She would send designs back again and again and again and again until it was right. So yes, she was the author. So there wouldn't be a motive there, some disgruntled designer saying, Florence stole my designs. That simply is not possible. It's unlikely. She would have suggested to the others what to do and guided them. And then in the end, nobody wanted Kate Daja's designs, they wanted Florence Broadhurst's designs. So if you work for any big design house, your, your designs are used. You're a, a designer, but you're working under the master or mistress in her case. Was she a hard task mistress? She was. She was, but fair. You know, always fair. And she scared a lot of people. They were absolutely terrified of her. Did you, at the time, think of your mother's acerbic tongue? How this might have been the motivator for somebody, that she could reduce a man to anger and violence? Yes, definitely. She could strip a man to bare bone. I've seen ex-employees in tears after she given them the, a work over. But you also felt the broad edge of that tongue as well? Oh, definitely, on many occasions. And what would that be like? 
um, and very humiliating. Particularly, she didn't choose the location that she used her tongue. And it could quite possibly be in public. And um, uh, if it was possible, there were times you'd want to crawl under the carpet. Next. Who benefited most from the will? Me. How Robert became a prime suspect in his mother's murder. Mrs Broadhurst was a leading figure in Sydney's high society. And high society turned out in force for her funeral. St Mark's Church of England in fashionable Darling Point was packed for the service. Police stood opposite and checked the mourners as they entered the church. Who benefited most from the will? Me. Again, which puts the spotlight back on you. I'm the only beneficiary. Robert Lloyd Lewis was a key suspect in the murder of his mother. Suspicion usually falls on those close to the victim first, and Florence's only child was a logical choice. Robert's relationship with his mother was difficult and often tempestuous. She was all about her career and her life and being Florence Broadhurst. I mean, you were sent off to boarding school as a five-year-old. That's a bit tough. It was, uh, particularly when um, you were in sight of your, your parental home. I mean, we're talking about three miles away from where your parents lived. I didn't come home like most kids on long weekends from boarding school and school holidays. I'd get sent to my grandfather up in Mount Perry. It was a testing time. And it wasn't until I was an adult that she and I started to develop a relationship. She was there for you in material ways when you lost your first wife? Correct. She told you to get on with it, Robert? Yes. I was able to spell Tanqueray backwards. I was drinking a bottle of gin a day. She said, you know, man up, you've got children, you've got to look after them. And I'm not going to be their surrogate mother. Get on with it. So was this the compassionate Florence coming out, as much as she could muster? Yes, probably. So that marked a, a change in your relationship from Definitely. there, Definitely. Yeah. What was it like after that? Uh, like two adults, more accepting of each other's role. But the relationship was still turbulent. Following Florence's murder in 1977, police showed great interest in an argument between Robert and his mother. It took place in the factory with an earshot of other employees on the day before she was brutally murdered. She and I argued over the problem that she had in the office with people siphoning money out of a bag. To me, it was obviously one of her staff. And I argued and said, you must put your bag in a safe. And she said, no, no, I trust my son. How much money been going missing? A hundred here, 150 there, 200, 50, 150. At first I said, are you sure, you know, you just haven't spent it? No, 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 I keep a record. And she did keep a record of what she spent. So it probably amounted to thousands. It could have. That was what the argument was about. I'm going to get a safe and put it in here. You're going to put your bag in there because. That was typical of my relationship with my mother at that time. It had been improving, but she was still apt to put you oh, back yeah. in your place as a child, as it were. Yes. So it became quite a substantial oh, row? It was quite a substantial row. It was well enough a row to create the suspicion, if you like, with the police that maybe I had been involved.
So the argument was on the Friday and the murder was on the Saturday afternoon. Police questioned Robert on his whereabouts and his alibi checked out. He said he'd been playing golf with three friends and then drinking at the clubhouse bar until about 6 p.m. What was your feeling about what had happened? You knew that money had been stolen. Did you think it was connected? Yes. Because money was freely available. There was $8,000 in her handbag that day. But there was an additional $250,000 in a safe deposit box or two. Did you tell the police this? No, I don't think I did. Don't think they ever asked. Well, uh, at this stage, uh, we're appealing for uh, any persons who may have been here uh, uh, on Saturday. Anything that was a bit untoward will may have been seen by somebody that might be able to assist us. And we're making an appeal on, along uh, those lines. What did you perceive the police's main line of inquiry to be in those early days? I think that they were looking for a quick fix. Uh, I don't think they did their job correctly and, and efficiently. Next, never before had we seen a serial killer attacking grannies. Did Florence fall victim to Australia's most notorious serial killer? There's no doubt in my mind that John Wayne Glover was responsible for the murder of Florence Broadhurst. For more than a decade, the police file into the murder of Florence Broadhurst lay gathering dust until a serial killer named John Wayne Glover began killing old women on Sydney's North Shore. You had the Boston Strangler, you had Jack the Ripper, but never before had we seen a serial killer attacking grannies. 82-year-old Mrs Mitchell Hill was found by two schoolboys on the ground outside the front door of her Mossman units yesterday afternoon. Bleeding heavily from a severe wound to the back of the head, Mrs Mitchell Hill died later in hospital. In a 12-month killing spree on Sydney's North Shore, one man bludgeoned six elderly women to death. That man was John Wayne Glover. At that stage, the immediate focus was on the six elderly women that had been killed. Five of the women were plucked at random off the street. The last woman, Mrs Sinclair, he had an association with. The sixth Northside murder occurred in a house at Beauty Point. The dead woman, believed to be in her 60s, was found by a relative about six o'clock last night. When police arrived, it's believed they found a man in his late 50s inside the house. So, after 12 painstaking months, task force detectives hunting the granny killer believe they've finally got their man. Well, my name is Dennis O'Toole. I'm a retired Detective Chief Inspector. In relation to the Glover murders, I was the Chief Investigator appointed by the Homicide Squad. What an extraordinary case. Does it stay with you still? Unfortunately, yes, it does. In what way? Uh, basically because it's unfinished business. Do you have any doubt that John Wayne Glover killed Florence Broadhurst? There's no doubt in my mind that John Wayne Glover was responsible for the murder of Florence Broadhurst. Before we examine in detail the similarities between the Broadhurst murder and the granny killings, it's worth pausing to take a look at the character of John Wayne Glover. What motivated him to attack and kill elderly women? There was an underlying hatred, I would have to say, for elderly women. We 
go back to his mother. Two or three members of his family told me about how John had found some photographs of his mother during the war. And they were, if not pornographic, that they were, uh, they were nude shots and that uh, he never got over that. Glover's mother issues were in plain sight in the granny killings. His modus operandi was to bash his victims with a hammer from behind. That's what killed them. But with four of the women, Glover didn't stop with the bashing. He strangled them with their own pantyhose and staged the bodies in such a way as to make a statement. The uh, first thing that struck any of the investigating detectives was the ferocity uh, of the attacks, uh, the viciousness, and how in each occasion the victim was obviously degraded by the offender. The manner in which they were left, the manner in which their clothing was removed, it all appeared that whoever had committed these offences wanted to shock degrade the person and convey that to whoever discovered the, uh, the body at that particular time. My father, Dr John Shan, was a forensic psychiatrist in the 1980s. He interviewed John Glover over the granny killings. He said that if you asked him the right questions, showed him the right evidence, then a confession would soon follow. Glover never admitted to killing Florence Broadhurst. But Genesis O'Toole was able to prove that the serial killer met Florence five years before she was murdered. Glover first met Florence at a wedding in 1972. He and his wife also visited Broadhurst factory and purchased curtains from her. I put that to Glover. He denied it and uh, I told him, well, the information that I got it from was uh, pretty good. And he, uh, he then admitted that, uh, oh, yes, he had done that. He had met her on a number of occasions. And in actual fact, they went to a christening of Glover's sister-in-law, uh, where Glover was the godfather. And uh, he spent some time with Florence at that occasion, and that was put to him. He denied it initially, and then he, he came to the party and admitted it. By all accounts, they were like magnets attracted to each other. Why There's, do you think? Maybe it was Florence's charisma. She would always want to know who was in the room, uh, so it might have been simply for business purposes. But people afterwards did wonder if there was more to it than that. There's no evidence to suggest that Glover was in a relationship with Broadhurst, but he was 30 years her junior, and it's well documented that Florence was drawn to younger men. Florence had quite a lot of lovers and boyfriends, quite a lot younger than her too. She wasn't short of a bloke. And you saw these guys coming through yeah. their life? Yeah. What sort of people were they? Nice. Where yeah. did she meet them? Oh, out at a party or, you know, she was the darling of the, the eastern suburb set. She was one tough hombre, as they would say in the classics. She was a very astute businesswoman. She was very successful. And uh, I think that that would have attracted Glover. To look at the crime scene pictures, what did those pictures tell you? Viewing those photographs uh, from memory, the first thing that hit me was that this is another victim of John Wayne Glover. All of her rings had been stolen. They'd been removed with a great deal of force from her hands. Fingers were broken. But her handbag was opened and the money stolen. 
Now, that was a signature of John Wayne Glover during the granny murders. And not just the granny murders. When Dennis O'Toole questioned Glover about Florence Broadhurst, he also questioned him about two unsolved murders on the Central Coast. Two elderly women that were killed the same way as his other victims. 72-year-old Josephine MacDonald was strangled and sexually assaulted in her Etalong flat in August 1984 and 80-year-old Wanderer Munson in her Yamina home November 1986. In each of those occasions, the, the two women, unfortunately, from the Central Coast were killed in their own homes. It was from a blunt instrument from behind. They were also strangled, but str strangulation probably did not cause a death. It was the horrific nature of the injuries. They were degraded by the clothing being removed. And in the case of Florence Broadhurst, um, it was particularly degrading how uh, clothing had been removed. Her clothing had actually been placed in the toilet and uh, her head had been placed in the toilet. There's no question that Florence's head was in the toilet when she was found. However, there is a big question mark about how much clothing had been removed from her. Tony Russell, the young cop who found the body, was most definite. But as he recalls it, only her cardigan was shoved into the toilet. Otherwise, she was dressed from head to toe. And there was no sign that he could see of sexual assault. How the body was arranged is incredibly important to the conclusion a lot of people have drawn, connecting the murder to John Glover, the granny killer. You didn't see any evidence of staging or of sexual degradation. You just saw a brutal, vicious attack. That's what I seen. Uh, she still had a top on. When I seen her body, her left arm, I think, was hanging down beside her and a right one was looped around the top of her head and dangling into the toilet. Tony had to force entry, charging the toilet door to discover the body. Her legs were behind her. And yeah. so, I just... so you've actually pushed her body with the door? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if I've moved a body. I, I would have. You would have. Your observations of the crime scene were not recorded. Nope. The body is then moved without that evidence being recorded. So suddenly continuity is gone. Mm, that's true. Did you give a statement? No. 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 No statements ever taken from me. That remarkable. I, oh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of questions to be asked. Um, nope, no statements. Coming up. David Bond was one of the last people to see Florence Broadhurst alive. Was he a suspect? The police did interview him. Was it her most trusted employee? During our interviews for this show, we've discovered that police never investigated a key piece of evidence in the Florence Broadhurst murder. That's because no one ever took a statement from Tony Russell, the young cop who unknowingly moved the body. I know why I was written out of the story, because it was my first day there. And I was told they were going to exclude me because I was green and they didn't want me to be involved in the coroner's court, which I can take. But when I see the descriptions of the, the site and the way, the way we found her, that concerns me a great deal because it did, it did it have an impact on the result and the murder. I think people might have taken artistic view in writing stories. I read in one particular case, Detective Sergeant described coming into the scene and he said he had to uh, sidestep and walk around all the debris left over from the struggle in the annex. I'm going, well, there's no debris there because there was nothing out of place. The only place there may have been debris is in the toilet. I read another article where the uh, annex 
and the walls were covered in blood. There was no blood on the walls. We would have been alerted to a body. Tony's first-hand account has not been on the record until now, and that certainly hampered the investigation from the beginning. But one thing's for sure, whoever killed Florence Broadhurst was familiar with the layout of her Paddington factory, upstairs and downstairs. Broadhurst's son Robert maintains that a member of his mother's staff killed her. And I believe it for the following reasons. One, they knew the run of the factory. They knew where to get certain implements. They knew how to get out of the back of the factory and close it so it wouldn't uh, appear as though it would, had been opened. Um, and the fact that she made two cups of tea. Who did she make cups of tea for? Uh, the only cups of tea that I've ever seen her make for staff was for her head printer at the time. In 1977, David Bond was the head printer at Florence Broadhurst Design. He'd been working alongside Florence from the very beginning in 1960, when Broadhurst plucked him off the streets. What was their relationship like? It was an unusual one. He was a Bernardo's boy. She'd, she, he was she, like a surrogate son. Yes, uh, he, he certainly was. And uh, she, uh, at one stage, saved him from, from himself. Uh, by, by that means uh, that he was a, a tear away, naughty boy, whatever. And um, she took him under, under a wing. And uh, I think... Uh, she made him the man that he ended up. David Bond was one of the last people to see Florence Broadhurst alive. He and a co-worker worked a shift at the factory on the Saturday she was killed. They worked downstairs, she was upstairs in her office. Bond and the co-worker left the factory at about four o'clock leaving Broadhurst on her own. Was he a suspect? Oh, I'm sure he probably was. I don't know that David and I ever had that discussion, you know, do you feel as though that you were a suspect? But I do know that the police uh, did um, interview him and, and were satisfied in whatever story that he'd given them. Which brings us back to John Wayne Glover. Would he have had a cup of tea with Broadhurst before bludgeoning her to death? They had obviously had a cup of tea. There were no fingerprints. Um, but there were no fingerprints on any of the crime scenes. We knew that he wore gloves. He planned in advance what he was going to do. It wasn't a one-off thing. He, he selected his, his victims. He called the shots. He called the time and the place that he was going to commit those horrendous acts. Still to come. Fraud squad detectives have joined the homicide squad in investigating a possible fraud said to involve a substantial amount of money. Florence Broadhurst is understood to have been a victim of the fraud. Was Florence murdered by a society con artist? John Wayne Glover was never charged with the murder of Florence Broadhurst. Police could never place him close enough to the factory on the day of the murder. Dennis O'Toole, the head of the Granny Killer Task Force, visited Glover in jail many times, even after he'd left the force. On one such visit, Glover showed the retired detective a drawing he'd made at the Hydro Majestic Hotel in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney. It was just a random sketch but Glover suggested that it held the answer to other unsolved crimes he'd committed. He said, did you have a good look at the trees? They're significant. 
and the word he used was significant. Somebody picked it out later that there was a numeral in the uh, drawn in the trees, and that has the number nine. The number nine would coincide with the extra three murders. The number nine is significant because O'Toole had been trying to extract a confession from Glover over three unsolved murders. Broadhurst and two elderly women on the central coast of New South Wales, making a total of nine kills. I thought, now I've got something you've got to tell me. I've got something to go and see you about. How are you going to get out of this one? I was in actual fact planning to go and see him the following week. One of Sydney's most notorious murderers, granny killer John Wayne Glover, has taken his own life in Lithgow Jail. Glover was found hanged today in his cell. In 2005, Glover committed suicide in jail before O'Toole could discuss his theory with him. So it was with bitter disappointment that I found uh, that he'd died. So he manipulated you again? He beat me. He certainly beat me. No, I didn't get there. There were many suspects in the spotlight in the weeks and months following the Broadhurst murder. With so much interest in the case, police carefully observed her funeral. It was well known in society circles that Florence Broadhurst had made a lot of enemies in her work. Fraud squad detectives have joined the homicide squad in investigating a possible fraud said to involve a substantial amount of money. According to police, the fraud inquiries are in their infancy. But National 9 News has been told that these inquiries involve the disappearance of money from the trust accounts of many wealthy people in Sydney's eastern suburbs. Florence Broadhurst is understood to have been a victim of the fraud. She'd always said that it was a friend of hers because she wouldn't want to appear as though she would, was gullible enough to get caught in the... So you think silly people get caught, dear? And that could have been a possibility, again, that wasn't explored? Not to my knowledge. It was an interesting time in Sydney around the mid-70s. There were a number of crooks who basically ran the joint. There was considerable corruption in the police force. There was organised crime. There was danger. There were parties. There were tragedies that to this day remain unsolved. It's a really interesting city, Sydney. <laughs> Police had several suspects in the frame for this brutal crime, but it wasn't long before the trail went cold. Today, it's uncertain whether anyone could be convicted over this case. Crucial evidence, including the crime scene photographs and the murder weapon, are long gone or mislaid in the archives of New South Wales Police. Dennis O'Toole tried to revive this investigation, but he didn't have enough to go on. He needed a confession from his key suspect, a serial killer who committed suicide. Despite all the roadblocks, many still want this case solved. Florence's image comes back more than any other image that I ever experienced in the police, my time in the police force. Why? Because it was the trauma or the shock of finding... If you're not expecting it and you walk into something like that totally unprepared, I think it's the shock of it. I don't think it was a burglary. It was a very private, personal hate. To, to commit a murder and do those things that, that were done to that lady. One day there'll be closure. One day someone will solve it and hopefully have the right evidence to do so. At the time, we were very disappointed. 
all of the detectives that were involved intimately with that investigation believed he was responsible. We simply didn't have that extra bit of evidence. Do you think that will ever come out? Is it possible, do you think? I don't know. I'd like to hope so. Whether it ever does, I can't tell you that. Now, Dennis O'Toole, a retired homicide detective, has spent years following up the link between John Wayne Glover and your mother's murder. Do you think he's wasting his time? Personally, yeah. Often this long after a murder, even the victim's family will say, I don't want any more, it's enough. What's your view on that? If there was a chance for justice now, would you pursue it again? Definitely, right now. I, I would love to be able to go to my grave and say, we did it, we've, we've got it for you, Mum. It's important, important to me.